Canadian ancestry in Oklahoma uh, today. In Wisconsin here, you can see the, the reservations here. You got six Ojibwe uh, bands of Ojibwe. You also have the Menominee, the Oneida, the Stockbridge, and the Ho Chunk. Uh, many of these were removed. Ho Chunk were removed from Wisconsin. The Potawatomi were removed from Wisconsin. The Oneida were removed from New York. So were the Stockbridge. Uh, they were removed, and they were attempting to move out of this particular area. The Ojibwe were actually Menominee were going to be removed. The Oshkosh, who was the chief of the Menominee, he traveled to Washington. And he gets the president to rescind that order so the Menominee stay here. Uh, Pajiki, Buffalo, he also did the same thing. So they were going to remove Ojibwe people from uh, Wisconsin, but he was able get the president to rescind that order too. And you get the current reservation that you see here in the northern part of Wisconsin here. And again, this is all part of things that are happening. And you see the Minnesota reservations, which are Ojibwe in Dakota in Minnesota here too. The majority of Ojibwe, the tribe that I belong to, are living with speakers are in Canada, the majority up there. Just a real brief thing, when you think about the challenges and teachers to students, so take a look at asking about Ojibwe language, but one of the things that is difficult, you know, to, for translating, there's a lot of not words for that translate many times. And so we try to find words to fit uh, in this particular, something like what Israel did too. Israel, when they, before they got their, their national language, they had to find words for like jets and all kinds of different things that they never had before in their earlier language. The same process is happening with Ojibwe here too. But when you take a look at Ojibwe, you know, and we're working on it, trying to find it. There's a growing need from Ojibwe people in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and, and, uh, Michigan, as well as in Canada. But all tribes throughout the country are in the process of trying to maintain their language. It's very difficult. Uh, we're losing a lot of the, the fluent bank, the fluent speakers, the first speakers that were born into it uh, there. Uh, my parents uh, were born into the language, uh, but my grandparents uh, made a decision that they wanted to, they felt they should learn uh, English uh, because of all the discrimination that was going on, and they thought it would be better for them to learn English and that people wouldn't be discriminating them as much as they would. And so they thought they would get ahead better so my, my uncle, uh, who spoke Ojibwe, but my mother, when she was born in 1930, they decided that she got ordered to stop speaking Ojibwe. My mother was understood Ojibwe, but she wouldn't speak it uh, because of the boarding schools that were there. But again, we take a look at uh, the language itself, immersion. We find immersion is the best, but we have many different programs that are going on you know, throughout the country today. Here too. If you look at the, these particular reservations in Minnesota, and Wisconsin, a friend of mine, uh, Anton Troyer, who teaches uh, up at Bemidji State in Michigan, uh, Minnesota. Uh, he took a look at uh, gathering this information here. And you look at the number of fluent speakers. These are fluent speakers left on the reservations. And you can take a look at, you know, Red Lake has the most at 400, Mille Lacs 150. Well, even some of the reservation like Fond du Lac 0, St. Croix 25, Lacuda Ray 10, like the Flamble 3, Bad River 2, Red Cliff 1. Bow Lake one. And so we have a large number, not a large number, but dwindling individuals who are fluent uh, first uh, language speakers in Ojibwe. And that's what we're dealing with today too as part of language and extinction there too. But you take a look at over 300 languages that were spoken in America and Mexico, that has also dwindled today. We're still dealing with that particular the loss of languages there too. Uh, if you take a look at the Ojibwe Moments, part of the Algonquin language group, um, you see the three fires. Uh, many times we talk about the Potawatomi and the uh, Odawa uh, and the Ojibwe, which were one band at one time, but they had different functions. You need to call them the three fires. And, uh, when they split, split apart, the English started referring to what their functions were. And so that's how you get to the Ojibwe, to the Potawatomi's firekeeper, Odawa means traitor. So their functions. To this day, they sort of uh, separate them. But they're one language, it's like different languages, different dialects of Spanish, or different dialects of English. Uh, you understand it, or you got to listen to it a little bit more closely there, too. Uh, Ho Chunk, which is in Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin here, uh, Ho Chunks are also in the process of trying to revitalize their language, too. Uh, it's a difficult process, but we're working very heavy on it. It's not dialect of Ojibwe. Ho-Chunk and uh, Ojibwe are like German and English. 
They're different. They have a real strong, like German, they got a and the uh, Ho-Chunk do, they got a real deep It's a glottal sound in there and you got to you shift that around and make changes in there too. I tease my wife sometimes and tell her I speak Ho-Chunk. <laughs> Danny, how do you speak Ho-Chunk? Uh, that's just teasing though. But uh, it's different from Algonquin. Oneida, as I mentioned before, is part of the Iroquois <coughs> in the New York area. It's also different from Ojibwe, it's not dialectically different. Uh, and you take a look at Stockbridge. The Stockbridge has lost their particular languages at stake. They're trying to revitalize it to uh, one of the tribes that was uh, they're familiar with, which is the Delaware. So it's the closest dialect that they had, so they're trying to revitalize it uh, that particular way there, too. Um, one of the main things that happened to tribes is that uh, lots of federal and boarding schools, and missionary and boarding schools. The whole federal policy has always been to assimilate and to acculturate tribal people. They tried to do it with the adults, it wasn't working, so what they did, the next target population was the children. And so then uh, in 1871, they, make a, they quit making treaties with the United States government, with the tribes, and then they also and make all tribal people wards of the United States government after 1871. So every single Indian person from the youngest to the oldest now become a ward of the United States government, which gives the, the, to the Bureau of Indian Affairs that particular ability to move children around. And so they picked up a lot of children and moved them into boarding schools. We had several generations, and when they came out of these boarding schools, they didn't teach Indian, they just taught English there too. And that was part of the process there too. So we have this vision that we're working on it very strongly, and this is what we, many people are doing. This is part of the process there too. And I want to, uh, later on, when I get to talking a little bit about uh, music, and uh, Leah's going to be talking, and she's gonna go right into the music, and then I'll come back on, and we'll do a little bit more music. We're gonna do a little bit hands-on, experiential uh, learning, but you're not, not gonna sit down, because we don't want you to get what you call the FB. And the FB, my uncle said, is called the flat butt syndrome. And if you sit down too long, your rear end tends to get flat. He said, we all got to be considerate of that. And so have people stand up or do something so you can alleviate the, M the, M the FB. So when we do that, all of you are going to jump up, jump down. When you got up, it was flat. When we come back down, the round the ship pop back up. <laughs> and uh, if uh, it stays flat, and you can blame it on the chancellor and his staff <laughs> that uh, they gave you an FB when you came here, and that's what happened. So, but now that, that's just teasing. Uh, but you'll get a chance to move around and dance, and I'll talk a little bit about that too. But this time, I'm going to switch it over. Likewise, our Chancellor, Dr. Peterson, our, uh, my uh, dean, uh, Letters of Science, and also um, Sonny, because of his enthusiasm, I was able to come and have a teamwork and present uh, our respective languages and see that they, uh, they have similarities. <coughs> Uh, a lot of similarities. Claire Kramsch, in her book Language and Culture, states, language is a principle, means whereby we conduct our social lives. When it, when, it, when it is used in context of communication, it is bound up with culture in multiple and complex ways. Indeed, Quechua, or Unasimi, is a language of communication. We communicate through music, through songs, and through the language itself, but also our traditions. I hope that it will work, hopefully. I am going to speak a little bit about the Inca Empire, um, the importance of the language, songs, and dances for the survival of the indigenous culture, 
And also, I am going to talk a little bit about the action towards the revival and spreading the Runasini. Before the Inca Empire, there were many cultures. These cultures uh, survived, for instance, from 15th century to 22,000 years. And they were Tiahuanaco, Nazca, Paracas, Caral, Chavín, the Wantar, uh, etc. And samples of their culture are still, um, we can in, still enjoy their ar architecture, their sculpture, their ceramics, pottery, um, etc. The Inca Empire uh, developed from the 13th century to 16th century. Uh, it was, as you see the map, it was actually uh, the borders were extended uh, through uh, South America, Western South America, centered on the Andes of mountains, including besides Peru, including Bolivia, um, see, Bolivia, uh, Chile, Argentina, you can see Argentina, and it went up to Colombia at the river. You know, it was such an extended Inca empire, such an extended uh, empire. But this empire was interrupted when Francisco Pizarro, yeah, you are Francisco Pizarro, arrived in Peru in 1532. He was illiterate, but audacious. And the Spanish invasion relied on the uh, division of the land of the many cultures that we had in, in Peru, and they were conquered by the Incas. It is very important to talk about the first Peruvian writers. Uh, they were mestizos. Um, with the, their mother, for instance, Inca Garcilaso de la Vega, her mother was a princess, Inca princess. And her father wa his father was a captain, Spanish captain. He wrote commentarios reales, it means the uh, royal commentaries, uh, in 1609. Uh, this, in this royal commentary, he wrote about the Inca Empire, about the administration, the economy, the religion, and the way they conquered um, the, the other nations. Um, this commentary of reales actually uh, used the uh, rhetoric of humbleness in order that the readers, lectors, lectures, uh, readers uh, could read the, the book. And he, is, he says, among the old different quotes, he says, I am writing because many Spanish chronicles uh, were written by Spanish, and they, because they didn't know the language, the indigenous language, they misinterpreted many things. So I am going to uh, talk about my culture, about the Inca, on a, on a way um, uh, because I know the language, because it's my uh, mother tongue. On the other hand, Felipe Guaman Poma de Ayala, uh, he was also a mestizo, uh, although he was more uh, identified with the indigenous part. His book was Nueva Coronica o Buen Gobierno. It means a new chronicle and a good government. Uh, it was uh, finished in 1615, but actually the book never was published. The book was an iconographic book. Uh, as you see here, um, some of the examples, uh, some of the for instance, this is the, when the last Inca Atahualpa was executed. Um, and he writes about that. He said that Inca was uh, executed. I was, and the other one is, you don't see it so clearly, sorry, but it is the, when an uh, indigenous person is tied up to a, to a, to a log, a standing log, 
and his neck is very tight because he didn't um, actually um, deliver uh, the right number of eggs. There were two eggs missing. He said like that in the in the in the writing part. Uh, and he writes about the, how the, in the Spaniards actually treated so badly the indigenous people, but also the uh, black uh, slaves. Um, his, actually, this book was found at the Royal Danish Library in Copenhagen in 1909, 1908. And he was the first Faximer was published in Paris in 1936, so late. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the indigenous population. When, before the, the Spaniards arrived, the, in 1520, we, ha we were nine million. Uh, then they arrived in 1532, uh, just very short, after in 1570, it increased 1,300,000. In 1630, 600. You know, this is according to Bunny Smith and Brian Bauer, History of the Incas. It happened that Bunny Smith was my, my, was my student, Spanish student, and now she is my colleague. And she's publishing. And about 4.5 million of Peruvians speak Quechua and eight million identified themselves as Quechua or Runasimi um, speaking people. The Runasimi is the most extensive language worldwide. Around 10 million people speak one or more 45 variants of this family language. Um, Let's see. The Bunasini actually, the word uh, that the colonial Spanish gave it, Quechua, derived from the Bunasini Quechua that refers to the geographical region located 2,300 to two, uh, 3,500 meters above, above sea level. The other meaning of Quechua is the nation, Sapainga Pachacute annexed by the Inca Empire in 1483. And here you are, you see, this is the Chang, it is referring to the region of uh, Pukrachanka. Uh, so Quechua is not the correct name of our language. Uh, well, the native language, when someone asks, what do you speak? Imata Rimanki Tai Tai, Runa Sinita Rimani. It means, what do you speak? Uh, I speak Runasini. I am going to talk a little bit the linguistic part of, K, of the Runasini. There is a, we have so many linguistics in Peruvian linguistics. Um, Serron and so forth. Tobaldo, Alato, but the one of the linguistics from is from German, Germany, uh, Wolfgang Wolk, in his book, Pequeño Breviario Quechua, is a brief um, um, book of Quechua, or Runasimi, uh, he said the following. Um, he said that Runasimi is a, is a language that uh, actually it it is branched out toward the right from a root to which mood, tense, person, and other subpieces are pra placed. Um, actually, it, is, it goes from right to left and from left, left to right. Uh, this process actually stimulates both uh, right and left cerebral hemisphere, and not only the left brain as with the European. For instance, this example, is asirachiwanki. Asirachiwanki is one word. As uh, Sony was explaining, in Okiwa o Ojibwe, they have so a sentence just in one word. 
uh, we say ra intermittence. She causative, one conjunction, and he second person you. It means it means you make me to laugh or laughing you make me. Um, I am going to talk a little bit uh, about the racism in Peru. Even uh, I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, let's see. But even the president of Peru, well, it was, it was, um, I'm sorry, it was about um, what the president said uh, when um, actually the indigenous from the jungle uh, protested because uh, Peru was going to, to sign the U.S.-Peru Free Trade Agreement, and this is so bad. No puede hacer el gobierno sino actuar con energía para que el orden, que es un principio básico, las sociedades eh, piden siempre a los estados orden. Y ya está bueno, ya está bueno, pero estas personas no tienen corona. Estas personas no son ciudadanos de primera clase que puedan decir 400.000 nativos a 28 millones de peruanos, tú no tienes derecho de venir por aquí. De ninguna manera. Eso es un error gravísimo. Y quien piense de esa manera quiere llevarnos a la irracionalidad y al retroceso primitivo en el pasado. Estas personas no son ciudadanos de primera clase. How come a president can say that they are not people? And it is very brave, and he is the president. And we are, the indigenous people, are fighting for a right to be consulted if they want to use our lands. But there, were, there was actually the current president had a, a, a law, passed a law saying we are going to consult, but actually they don't consult. They will say, you know, if we want to um, see the um, actually advance, we have to go anyway to mining, logging, and, and also oil drilling. Uh, in order to actually continue with our language, with Runa Simi, we need some publications. You can see some publications in Spanish, some of them in Runa Simi and Spanish, and some of them just in Spanish. Uh, the last one is our book, uh, actually written by my brother and I, and it is 2014, and it is um, written and it is referring to collection that we collected, actually it was a workshop in La Ramarca. This is the place, our hometown, up in, I'm, I'm sorry, up on the mountains, you can see. Down there are um, mining. Uh, anyway, uh, we try to continue with our heritage and the survival of our language and we are doing to our foundation all kinds of things, um, like uh, we created a library in the town for the first time. Um, I, later, if you ask me more questions, I can tell you how we created a library. It's very, it's very unique. Um, leaving the culture to music and dance is very important. As I said before in the opening, uh, music and songs are actually communication. And that, that helped us to survive, and we are here. We are still here. And thank you very much for coming here. And right now, I am going, we are going to have the musicians who are going to illustrate how is the language. They are going to play to pieces, and then we are going to get involved, the audience, and show you how we dance and actually uh, enjoy. First of all, uh, Richard Kilmer, he's a uh, physics, and, but also he likes playing um, the guitar. He's very well known in Madison. My brother, Numa Almatanti, uh, he's, he's still a doctor, but he doesn't work as a doctor. Thank you. He doesn't work as a doctor. He's a bilingual resource specialist in Madison in one high school, helping the Latino students advance.
and we have to do that. And with you, please, uh, a round of applause.